Wasn't that such a neat video? I just think it's so cool to see all of y'all's faces up on the big screen and just see how awesome an environment that we have established here at Clear Mountain and that we get to partake in that and play a role in that each and every Sunday. So my name is Casey Cup, and I just have two things that I need to let you be aware of. First off, if you're a first time guest here at Clear Mountain, if this is your first time visiting Clear Mountain, or if you're new to Clear Mountain, either works. We have a gift for you. So after the service today, if you could just exit out these doors and take a right, and you're gonna go to the guest services kiosk. We have a gift for you if you're new to Clear Mountain. We just wanna bless you and give you a gift. Also, sixth through ninth grade, I'm looking over here because that's predominantly you guys. But if you're in sixth through ninth grade, you are dismissed to go down to your class after worship today. And again, if you're new and you maybe don't know where that is, um, Mr. Chris Roth will be out in the lobby. So you can just go see him and he can show you where you need to go. So if you guys would please just stand with me, we're gonna enter right into praise and worship. I just wanna pray real quick, not real quick. I mean, it's not something I wanna do really quick, but I just wanna pray before we get started. All right, Heavenly Father, we just love you and we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we have a place that we can come and meet and just enter into your presence, learn more about you and grow in our relationship with you. We ask, Lord, that this morning, Holy Spirit, you just come. Lord, have your way, and we are just ready to receive. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord, and we all say amen.
And sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What well, looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, yeah, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. burdens down Ooh. here in the Father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh. you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. No failure's never final when the Father's in the room. find hope and love is on the move when the father's in the room prison doors fling wide the dead come to life and love is on the move when the father's in the room and miracles take place the cynical find faith and love is breaking through the Father's in the room, and Jericho walls are quaking, the strongholds now are shaking, and love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Yeah, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room.
God, we thank you for this time to come here this morning and worship together, that you would uh, you come and be with us and that there's no situation that's too dark for you. There's no prison walls you can't break down. We thank you for, for always being the God of revival. As long as we'll seek you, we can be revived. And we want revival to continue to break out, starting right here with each and every one of us. So we pray this morning as we go out throughout the rest of the service, God, that we'd be focused on you, focused on what you have for us, and focus on your will. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was talking, this massive, really loud trumpet covered the whole sky. And it was so loud, and we were all so scared, we sat down on the ground and we held hands. And I knew that it was time and I was going to be taken and my parents were going to be left. It was just like I saw a figure of a man. And, and now I just started saying, oh my God, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And I just billowing and then they parted. And then I saw like a Jesus like figure in the clouds and then I started lifting up. I started to lift up. It's like gravity was shut off. And all of a sudden I looked at my feet and my feet were literally floating up. And I was like, and this trumpet was so loud. Like, like, it was so loud. Like literally everyone in the world heard it. You could not miss it. It was like a trumpet. Um, it was just a one tone. But I, I, I did wake myself up because I was wondering if this was real. And even when I woke up, I could still hear it. I could hear the trumpet. It was loud enough for the whole world to hear, just like the Bible says. I remember saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And as I was standing there, I heard a loud sound of a trumpet and it, and it blew for for, for quite a while. But this one was like very, very low, like a, like a blow horn, like. So I'm sitting there and I hear this noise in the sky and it's literally like a trumpet and it's so loud. Well, this morning, actually, we're, we're starting a new series, um, a new sermon series that we're calling, What in the World is Going On? Um, so let, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for this time in the scriptures. Lord, we just ask you to open up our hearts to receive your word this morning, your truth, God. Uh, Holy Spirit, you're our teacher. You're our guide. So we just ask you, we invite you here to help us to understand and open up the word of God to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So like I said, we're going to be talking about uh, really end time events. The, the more I study the Bible, the more I believe that we are living in the end times. I believe we're living in the 11th hour of human history as we know it. Um, there are things that, uh, that, that are occurring and are changing around us at a very rapid pace. You know, I think about last year at this time, if I told you what was going to occur this year in 2020... <laughs> Uh, more than likely, you, you would have thought I went crazy or went off the deep end and say, man, we, we need to get a different preacher. This guy's, you know, gone off the deep end. But here we are in 2020 facing challenges we never could have imagined just a year ago. And it makes us wonder what, what in the world is going on. Uh, what's happening in our world? Are we living in a period of time that the Bible calls the last days? Well, I believe the Bible has the answers to those questions. 
Um, and, and the sermon series that we're starting today is going to focus on events that are going to unfold in the last days of human history as we know it. We're actually going to look at 12 different events that the Bible says are coming our way in the future. And we're going to start today by looking at an event that the Bible, Bible scholars call the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Now, actually, there's a couple of different um, comings of Jesus, and, and we'll get into this. Um, but there's the, the rapture of the church that happens where Jesus never actually comes physically and touches this planet, but he meets us in the air. And then there is also the second coming of Christ at the end of the Great Tribulation where he comes and he destroys the, the armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. So, but we're going to start today by looking at the, the rapture, with what we call the rapture. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus ascends into heaven in this dramatic fashion. And then an angel comes on the scene and speaks a prophetic word about what the disciples just saw as Jesus was ascended. I want to go to the book of Acts. This will be uh, the f first chapter of the book of Acts, verse 6. Uh, then they gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking end time events. They were thinking, man, you know, Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's going to kick the Roman government out and, and Israel is going to be established, his kingdom. <clears throat> He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. He was up in the clouds. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going up, when suddenly... Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So they prophetically, the, the angels prophetically gave this word after Jesus ascends up into the clouds. This very same Jesus, the one who just ascended into heaven, is going to come back just as you saw him leave. And when he returns, he will appear in the clouds in the same way that he left you today. So there is a day coming, and I believe it's soon, when Jesus is going to leave heaven, appear in the clouds, and he's going to take his church home with him. As a matter of fact, th this is true here. The rapture is the, the next major event on God's prophetic calendar. It's the next big thing on God's prophetic calendar that he's going to do. Jesus is going to come to earth. He's going to appear in the clouds. He will gather his people to himself. All the believers who are in heaven now, they're going to be coming with Jesus when he returns. <clears throat> and when the archangel blows the trumpet, the earthly bodies of all these saints that are with Jesus that are in heaven now, their bodies that are still in the grave or wherever they may be, in the ocean or wherever they would have died or if they were cremated, their bodies are going to be reconstructed. They'll be instantly glorified, instantly changed. They'll rise up into the clouds and they'll rejoin their spirit and their soul, which have been in heaven with Jesus. Then the believers that are still alive on earth, they're going to rise up to meet the Lord in the air, and so we're going to be with Christ forever. As the old hymn says, there's going to be a meeting in the, in the air, and it's going to be glorious, I do declare. So uh, the Apostle Paul really describes this event in, in the first chapter, or the first uh, book of the Thessalonians that he wrote. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, he says this. He describes this event, and he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, those that have gone on to be with the Lord, that were, that were in Christ, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Because So he's talking about believers that have passed. They have hope. because They're actually in heaven now. Their bodies are in the ground. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So he's saying those that are in heaven now, that have fallen asleep in Jesus, that are with him, they're coming back with him when he returns, is what he's saying there. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, who have already died. For the Lord himself will come, come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. And that's what you heard in that video. All these people were having these dreams about the trump of God and about the, the, the rapture occurring. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Those that are, their bodies are in the grave. They're going to rise up first. After that, 
we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Oh, and uh, don't forget this here. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage each other with these words. That's an encouraging word. And this event that Paul describes here, we call it the rapture. And the reason we do that, the Greek word that Paul used here when he wrote this to the Thessalonians, it, the, that we translate caught up is the Greek word harpazo. And when that Greek word is translated into Latin, which is what the first church did, the early church did, it's raptura is the Latin word, and that's where we get our English word rapture. So to be raptured means to be caught up. The believers are going to be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. It'll be just like the angel said when Jesus was, you know, ascended into heaven. Jesus is going to return the same way. Jesus will come back in the clouds and meet believers in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So the next question kind of becomes this. What, well, when's that going to happen? When is Christ going to return for his church? Well, the exact time of his coming is not known. Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven know. Many people over the years have tried to, you know, put specific dates on the return of Christ, and they've always been wrong. It, when Jesus tells us that we're not going to know the day or the hour of his coming, guess what? We're not going to know the day or hour of his coming. It, we're not going to know that. But Jesus did give us some specific signs that would mark the season of his return. We're never going to know the day or the hour of the Lord's return, but we're told that we can know the season of his return. So after Paul describes this particular event, the rapture, in the fourth chapter of Thessalonians, he goes on in the fifth chapter of, of Thessalonians to give us a little more insight about that. So we're going to go to the, the next chapter. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting with verse 1, says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, while everything looks good, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So it'll look like it's, everything's okay, everything's hunky-dory. There's peace and safety, everything's going well. And all of a sudden, boom, rapture occurs and there's going to be sudden destruction. And they will not escape the world. But you, that, see, he's, talking, he's speaking about the world there. That, that's going to be a thief in the night. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. It's going to surprise the world. But he's saying, church, you, you don't need to be surprised. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, like the world, let us be awake and sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. That's where the enemy likes to operate, in darkness. <clears throat> but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not, listen to this truth here, we're going to get into this, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, he comes back in the fifth chapter and says this too. Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up just as, fa as in fact you are doing. So those are more encouraging words from the Apostle Paul. As he sheds more light on the rapture. And one of the things that we learn from this is this. This is one of the truths. And these are in your bulletin, by the way, if you want to fill in the blanks. For the, for the world, the return of Christ will be like a thief in the night. For the world, the return of Christ is going to be like a, a thief in the night. So while the world's saying, you know, everything's okay, everything's at peace, everything's safe, then suddenly Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. And this event is going to catch the world completely off guard. They're not going to be ready for what, what comes next, what comes upon them. Like labor pains that suddenly come upon a pregnant woman, the whole world is going to be thrust into a chaos and destruction. If you think about this, this is going to be a crazy and chaotic time when millions of people, millions of believers instantly leave this world. Thousands of people will be driving their cars. There'll be Christians driving cars, and all of a sudden this car is not being controlled anymore. It's going to crash. Trains that had Christian engineers controlling them, they're going to derail, they're going to crash. Planes that had Christians piloting them are going to crash to the ground. 
Nations uh, whose leaders live for Christ, they're all of a sudden going to be without those leaders. Millions of people are going to lose family members and not know what to do or where to turn. So this world is going to be in total disarray. It's going to be in turmoil. It is not going to be a pretty sight. Paul says the world's not going to be able to escape the chaos and destruction that's going to occur because of this event. And the world has no clue that this event is even coming. They're going to be shocked. They're going to be surprised. But then Paul says, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. This day should not surprise you. We don't belong to the night or darkness. We're children of the light. We're children of the day. As faithful believers and followers of Christ, we're not asleep. We're awake. And we understand the season that we're living in. And it's not going to be a surprise to us. Now, we may not know the day or the hour, but we can certainly recognize the season we're in. We can know the signs of his coming. We can be watching and praying and earnestly looking for his return. And maybe you're thinking, man, this is really a bizarre event. This is just really weird. Why would God instantly remove all of his followers from the earth at once like that? I mean, after all, Christians, believers, they're the light of the world. They're the salt of the earth. They're his witnesses in this world. The the church of Jesus Christ, the true believers, the true followers of Christ, they embody what's good in this world. They help to restrain evil. Why would God remove them from this earth all at once like that? What's the reason for that? What's the purpose of that? Well, I'll tell you what the purpose is. The rapture precedes the judgment of God. The rapture precedes the judgment of God. God is removing his people from the world because judgment's coming. God is very patient, he's long-suffering, but there is a limit to his patience, and his justice demands punishment for sin and rebellion. So the wrath and judgment of God will be coming to this world. There is a period of time the Bible calls the Great Tribulation, where God pours out his wrath on the earth for wickedness. But before he does that, he's going to remove his people. That's the reason for the rapture. That's why Paul said what he did here in verse 9. Actually, I want to go back to that verse. We need to understand this truth. For God did not appoint us. He's talking to believers here. He says, brothers and sisters, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, to receive deliverance from our Lord Jesus Christ from the wrath that is to come. Now, there are those who are Christians, good Christians, well-meaning Christians, that believe that they're not going to be raptured before the Great Tribulation. They believe that they're going to have to endure the wrath of God just like the rest of the world. But this verse here, actually two of the verses that we've read, tell us something different. Actually, there's many other scriptures in the Bible that tell us that, that God has not appointed his children to wrath. The reason for the rapture is to save us from the wrath to come. I mean, that's the whole purpose of God pulling us out of the world, because he's getting ready to judge the world. And that's why Paul says this. That's why he says, encourage one another, comfort each other with these words about the rapture, because they're going to be spared from the wrath that's going to come after the rapture. And if we were not going to be spared from the wrath of the great tribulation, these words about the rapture would be hollow. They would be empty. They wouldn't encourage you. They wouldn't bring comfort. But the truth is, they're very encouraging because we're not appointed to wrath. So I want to look at Paul's next letter to the Thessalonians. It's there that Paul gives us some some signs that will precede the coming of the Lord. And one of the reasons Paul wrote this second letter to the Thessalonians was to dispel some of the false claims that Jesus had already returned. So a few months after Paul writes his first letter to the Thessalonians, he writes again to let them know about how things are going to play out when Christ does return. So we're going to go to the second uh, epistle of the Thessalonians. Chapter 2, starting with verse 1, says this, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, what he wrote about him in the last uh, letter to them, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, he's saying this message didn't come from us that the Lord's already come, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. He says don't believe that. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And we'll talk about what that is. And the man of lawlessness will be revealed after the, when the apostasy, after the apostasy happens. We'll go through that. The son of destruction. He's talking of actually about the Antichrist here. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, 
so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. The Antichrist is going to proclaim himself to be God. And this is what he's referring to. And you can read about that in Daniel and Revelation. Uh, The Bible talks about that. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? He was warning them about the things that were to come. And you know what restrains him now. So he's saying that the lawless one hasn't been revealed yet. You know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. So the Antichrist is going to be revealed, but something's restraining him, he's saying. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The Antichrist spirit's already been at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. He's actually talking about the church. We are the force that's restraining. It's God in us, his spirit in us, that's restraining evil from just overtaking this world. Then that lawless one, after we're out of the picture, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. And he's actually speaking about the second time Jesus comes back. This, the first time will be in the clouds. The second time will be at the end of the great tribulation where he destroys the, the armies of the Antichrist and he sets up his kingdom. So he's speaking of this when he comes back at his, his second coming in where he actually physically comes to this world. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, talking about the Antichrist, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. God wants all of them to be saved, but when they reject the truth and reject Christ, the only atonement they have for that, they're actually uh, losing their salvation in that way. They're, They're basically saying, I don't want you, God, and God is basically turning them over to that. For this reason, God will send uh, uh, upon them a deluding influence that they will believe what is false. In other words, he's going to allow Satan to do what he wants to do, basically. He's going to remove the church, and he's going to allow the enemy to come in like a flood. In order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So there is a judgment coming. And first, Paul lets them know that Christ hasn't returned yet. The rumors of that uh, are greatly exaggerated. They are false. So then Paul describes some things that are going to occur before Christ comes back. He tells them about an apostasy that will occur before Christ returns. An apostasy is when the truth of the scriptures are distorted and, and they're replaced with a lie. They Basically, it's false teaching. It's lies being promoted as truth. And other translations of this verse, it's described as a falling away or a rebellion. An antichrist spirit will invade the church and it's going to draw many people away from God. False teachers will come and promote things that are contrary to the Bible. And these, these teachers will be religious people. Uh, they're going to promote their false teachings in the name of God. These false teachers will infiltrate churches and lead people away from God. This will be one of the signs that the season of the return of Christ is near. And in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus about this. They asked him, what will be the sign of his coming at the end of the age? They wanted to know the signs that that would indicate when the time of his return was near. Jesus then talks about, uh, you know, wars, great wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes that are going to take place in the world. Then he talks about the church. He turns his attention to the church. And he says, false teachers will come and deceive many people. They will draw them away from the truth. And then he speaks of, of, of a lawlessness that will abound in the church and how the love of many believers will grow cold. He tells us there's going to be many that profess to be Christians, but they're actually not following Christ. They're living for themselves. And then he continues talking about the time of his return in the next chapter, the 25th chapter, as he tells a parable about uh, ten virgins, some five wise, five foolish virgins. And we're going to look at that parable because it's significant. At that time, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is speaking after they asked him about the time of his return. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The oil oil represents the presence of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. All through Scripture, oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy, and they fell asleep. Jesus is saying there's going to be a long period of time before his first coming and his second coming, and some are going to fall asleep. 
At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you, for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Very interesting parable that Jesus tells us here. He compares the church to ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Half of them are wise, half of them are foolish. So in this particular parable, Jesus is actually revealing a a truth about the church and actually about the rapture, and the truth is this. Only half of those who profess Christianity will be raptured. Only half of those who profess Christianity will be raptured. Jesus is really telling us that half of the professing church will be asleep. They will not be a part of those who are caught up together with Christ when he returns. Their love for Christ has grown cold. They've been lulled to sleep. An apostasy, a great falling away has occurred. Many false teachers have invaded the church and deceived many. And this is certainly a scenario that we see today in the church world. Many churches today have rejected the clear teachings of Scripture. They've embraced things that are unscriptural. They've embraced things that are ungodly, like the innocent destruction of human life through abortion. There's many churches today that condone abortion. They say a mother has a right to kill the unborn child that's in her her womb. They approve of this uh, shedding of innocent blood through abortion. Another apostasy found in churches today is a promotion of the LGBT movement. Many churches today are marrying same-sex couples. They're embracing the gay lifestyle. They're promoting it. They're saying it's acceptable to God. These same churches are also ordaining ministers that are openly homosexual. And they're telling us that you can lead a gay, gay lifestyle and still be a follower of Jesus Christ. And they've rejected the clear teachings of the Bible. They believe they can just kind of pick and choose what truths out of the Bible they want to believe, what they want to hold to. If a truth fits their lifestyle, then great, you know, they'll embrace it. But if that truth doesn't suit them, they reject it as being outdated and just do anything that they want to do. You know, some, some churches say there's no literal hell, there's no literal devil. Some of them say uh, the virgin birth of Christ was not legitimate. They deny the virgin birth. We have churches today that claim to be Christian, but have embraced the doctrine of universalism that says, ah, you know what, there's many paths to God. You don't have to put your faith in Jesus to be made right with God. You can be a good Hindu, or you can be a Buddhist, or you can be a Muslim and be reconciled to God. And they they reject the clear teaching of Jesus when he said he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through him. And we can see that this apostasy, this falling away that Jesus and the Apostle Paul both predicted has gained a foothold in the church today. Many churches today are rejecting the clear teachings of the Bible because this doesn't fit their lifestyle. It interferes with it, what they want to do. And what we see happening in many churches today is actually lining up with this parable of Jesus where only half of the professing church will actually be true disciples of Jesus that will be raptured at his return. The other half won't make it because they've rejected the truth and their love for Christ has grown cold. So please, uh, don't let that discourage you, though. Just because half of the professing church is not serving God, there are another half. Let's look at the the glass half full. There are many good Bible-believing churches that are still preaching the truth of the gospel. There are millions and millions of believers that love Christ, that are living for him. They've placed their faith in Jesus, and they've made him their Lord and Savior. They've been forgiven. They've been cleansed of their sins, and they're ready for his return. So don't let the unbelief, don't let the apostasy of some hinder you in your relationship with Christ. Love Jesus. Live for him. His grace will sustain you. Christ has empowered us to be overcomers in this world and to truly live for him. Now, God doesn't expect perfection from us, but we do need to be lovers of God that are seeking him and seeking to live in the truth. That's the way we keep our lamps full. That's the way we stay ready for his return. I want to go back to the second chapter of Thessalonians and look at another point that the Apostle Paul drives home about the second coming of Jesus here. 
I want to go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed, talking about the Antichrist, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So I just want to make sure you understand that this isn't going to happen, the great tribulation, the full appearance of the Antichrist will not happen until we're out of here, till the church is out of the way, the restraining force. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end at the appearance of his coming. Talking about when Jesus comes the, the next time after the rapture, seven years later actually, uh, with his saints to defeat the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. That's what that's speaking of there. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So it's, it's, it's really important that we understand that God is going to pull us out of here before the great tribulation occurs. The restrainer that Paul's talking about here is the church. God's people here on this earth are the restraining force of evil. If we weren't here, this world would be engulfed in sin, and worse than it is. Our prayers, our presence, the authority that we have now in this fallen world are keeping this world from becoming totally corrupted by Satan. And the Antichrist will not be revealed in his fullness until the church is raptured out of the world and their restraining presence is gone. The absence of the church will allow the Antichrist to, to launch the world into what, what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation Period. And I can only imagine what the world will be like when all true believers are gone. And that's why the rapture of the church has to occur before the tribulation can start. Because the power and the authority that we have as the church of Jesus Christ will not let the gates of hell prevail against us. But after we're gone, <laughs> it's game on for the devil. The forces of hell will be unrestrained. And this world is going to experience great sorrow and great trouble. All right, let's go to some other verses that show us that the rapture is going to come before the great tribulation. I want to make sure this is really settled in your mind because there's a lot of dispute and talk about that. This is from Luke, the 17th chapter. It's Jesus uh, talking about the, the end of the, of the age. This is kind of an equivalent parallel to what he was saying in Matthew 24. And it's from Luke's gospel. Then he said to the, to the disciples, Jesus, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven shines to the other part of heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. In other words, when the Bible describes it as a, in the twinkling of an eye or in a flash. When that lightning flashes, boom, we're going to be gone. I mean, it's going to be that quick, that instant, just like how quick lightning comes, hits the earth, and boom, it's, it's gone. So it's the same way it's going to be on the Son of Man when he comes, the Son of Man in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He was speaking of his crucifixion and, and what was going to happen to him in the coming days. And it, as it was in the days of Noah, listen to this. This is going to give us some insights here. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. Talking about in the days of his return. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. You know, everything was peace and safety and everything was good until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it also was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life, like Lot's wife, she was embraced the world. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Half of them will be still here. Half of them will be gone. 
Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Where are the eagles? They're up in the clouds. That's where the body is going to go. That's where our bodies are going to go. When we're raptured up, we're going to be up where the eagles gather. So Jesus here describes the condition of the world when he comes back the second time. He says it's going to be like in the days of Noah and Lot. People were eating, people were drinking, buying, selling, building, getting married. Jesus here is not describing a world that's going through the great tribulation. So those, those that say that the, the rapture is going to occur at the end of the tribulation, th- this doesn't match what Jesus is saying here. He's describing a pre-tribulation world that's just conducting business as usual. Everything's going on as you would think it should be going on. If Jesus was going to return during the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation, the things that he describes here would not fit. They would not fit. During the great tribulation period, it's going to be anything but business as usual. The tribulation period will be a time of great conflict, great upheaval. There's going to be incredible famine and pestilence and war on the earth. And one one uh, judgment, hail and fire mixed with blood will be hurled down to the earth. And actually one third of the earth is going to be completely scorched. The Bible says a third of the trees on this planet will be burned up. There are going to be comets and meteor showers hit the earth. And it's going to kill millions and millions of people. There's going to be tsunamis. There's going to be earthquakes that kill millions more. And just one of the judgments during the Great Tribulation period, one-third of mankind is going to be destroyed. It will not be business as usual during the Tribulation period. The Great Tribulation will not be like the days of Noah and Lot, where people are just kind of eating and drinking and buying and selling and, and, and getting married. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night to a world that is unsuspecting of his coming, and they're going on with business as usual. He's going to come and catch away his bride and save her from the wrath that's about to come onto the world because we're not appointed to wrath. As his followers, we'll be delivered from the wrath that's to come. And when we look at what Jesus said here about his second coming, it's very obvious that true believers will not be going through the tribulation period that's described in Revelation. Let me give you a couple of parallels from the, from the days of Noah and the days of Lot. These are going to help us see that Christ is coming for his church before the great tribulation period. So number one, Noah and Lot both lived in a very violent and immoral world. In a very violent and immoral world. If you look at what happened at Sodom, if you read what happened in Genesis 6 before the flood, it's a horrible situation as far as the immorality and the violence that's going on in the world. And that certainly fits the, 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 the day and hour we're living in now. It's a very uh, violent and immoral world right now. It's getting more violent, more immoral, more ungodly with each passing day. And then the second parallel to Noah and Lot is this. There was a righteous remnant that was removed before judgment came. There's a righteous remnant that was removed before judgment came. Noah was moved to safety on the ark when the world was destroyed by the flood. And Lot was removed from Sodom before it was destroyed with fire and brimstone. The angels actually told Lot, they said, look, we've got to get you out of here. We're not even allowed to destroy this city until we get you out of here. And just as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, the righteous remnant is going to be removed before the world is plunged into the great tribulation. Jesus here also gives us the picture of only half of the professing church making it in the rapture. He tells us that two will be present in the field, but only one's going to be taken. Two will be grinding at the mill, but only one will be taken. And Jesus makes it very clear that we can't ride on somebody else's coattails to be delivered from the trouble that's to come. He emphatically tells us, remember Lot's wife. She wasn't delivered from judgment just because she was married to Lot. To avoid the judgment to come, she needed to be right in her own relationship with God. So just being married to a believer does not uh, save you. It's not enough. We need to have our own relationship with Christ. I'll tell you something else. Just attending a church is not enough. We need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to have a surrender to his lordship, make him the Lord of our lives. Jesus tells us that whoever seeks to save his life is going to lose it. And whoever loses his life for Christ will save it. Christ is coming back for those who belong to him. He's coming back for the wise virgins whose lamps are full of oil. And he's coming back before the world is plunged into the great tribulation. So we don't need to live in fear that we're going to have to endure the great tribulation. Because God has not appointed us to wrath. 
as believers, we're going to be delivered from the wrath that's coming to this world. Jesus says, don't focus on self-preservation. He says, do not seek to save your own life. If you do, you're going to lose it. Don't focus on self-preservation. Instead, focus all your energy and on your efforts on your relationship with Christ. We're to passionately seek Him and love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we're to be a, a lovers of the truth. Uh, we read earlier where Paul said many people were deceived because they did not love the truth that they might be saved. So we need to be lovers of the truth, seekers of the truth. The best way to avoid deception that's in the world is to be a lover of the truth. God's word is always true, and we need to hold fast to that truth because it's under constant attack from the world. You know, the world's going to call you foolish for believing the word of God. They'll tell you it's outdated, it's full of errors, but they're wrong. They are wrong. They've been deceived by the enemy. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. God's word is absolute truth, and that truth needs to be hidden in our hearts. We need to study the scriptures. We need to renew our minds to the word of God. Let the word be the final authority in your life. Let the unchanging truth of the Bible be what sustains you. It's sustained people for centuries. It's reliable. When you build your life on the truth of God's word, you're building on a rock-solid foundation that's going to last for eternity. All other foundations are sinking sand. The philosophies of man are very fickle. They're constantly changing. They like to make a God in the image that they want. They create a God and they worship it. They think God is like this. They say God is like this. Instead of searching for truth and seeking the true and the living God, they create a God that they like, a manageable God that they can worship. So I'm just encouraging you to become a lover of truth, even when that truth is challenging or difficult. Never compromise the truth of God's word. And always be willing to give that truth to other people. But remember to be gracious when you give out that truth to other people. Please don't beat people over the head with the truth. You know, in John 1.14, the Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth. Jesus always told people the truth, but he did it graciously. He spoke the truth in love. Not to condemn them, but to offer them grace, to offer them forgiveness. And we need to be the same way. We need to love those that don't know the truth. We need to love those that are trapped in their sin. And speak the truth in love to them so they can be free. Because the truth is what will set them free. And we don't ever need to be ashamed of the truth. The truth is what saved us, and it's what's going to sustain us until Christ returns. All right, I want to wrap it up today with one last scripture. I want to go to Mark, the 8th chapter. Look at verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him, talking about Jesus, along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, talking about the world we're living in right now, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So th this is a truth that we need to uh, understand. The second coming of Jesus Christ is drawing near. The season is here. It is now. It is coming soon. The next great event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of his bride. Very soon, very soon, the trumpet of God is going to sound and we'll leave this world to be with Christ. And this is the time that we should be preparing our hearts for his return. This is the time to, to get full of oil, to get full of the Holy Spirit. This is the time to let go of any sin or anything else that hinders our relationship with Christ. This is the time to be a wise virgin. This is the time to live unashamed of Christ and unashamed of his word. And, and please don't be afraid that you're not good enough or you're not worthy enough for the second coming of Christ because none of us are. We're not qualified by our good works. It's our relationship with Christ. It's our drawing near to him. It's our loving the truth. It has nothing to do with how good you are or your performance. So don't withdraw from God because you feel like, oh, I can't live for Christ. Fear is from the enemy, and it draws us away from God. So this morning, you can give God all your fears. You can draw near to him. You can lose your own life and discover real life in Christ. You can be that wise virgin that fills his lamp with oil, and he is ready when the bridegroom comes.
Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the truth in the scriptures that, that tells us the season we're in, that really makes us aware, Lord, that your coming is nigh. And we need to be those virgins that are wise. We need to be the, the people of God that are ready. God, thank you that, that you've revealed truth to us, that we don't have to accept the lies of the enemy or the lies of false teachers, but that we can hold fast to your promises, to your word, that we can be secure in our salvation and our relationship with you, God. So help us. I pray that we don't allow our love to grow cold, that, Lord, we stay in that place of seeking you, loving you. It's all about relationship. It's all about uh, loving you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So help us to do that, I pray. Help us to be lovers of you and lovers of the truth, Father. Just pray for everybody in the sound of my voice here, God, that they would be ready for your return. They wouldn't be the one that's left behind, Lord, but they would truly seek you and love you and be ready for your return. That doesn't mean we're, we're perfect. That doesn't mean we're sinless. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means our heart's right with you, God. It means that we love you and we seek you, and we want, we want what your will to be accomplished in our lives. So, Father, I thank you for, for helping us with that, helping us to stay in that place of relationship with you. In Jesus' name.